Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing uh, the use of the nitrosoureas as uh, anti-cancer chemotherapeutics. Okay, so we've now discussed the structure of the organic base guanine. And there's only one more thing to say, which is that this nitrogen here, the third bond, is attached to the carbon, uh, the first carbon of the ribose sugar. So that's where that bond is. This is the bond that attaches it to ribose, or deoxyribose, since we're talking about DNA. Deoxyribose is the sugar that you have in DNA. I do apologize. I was saying the ribose sugar when I should have been saying the deoxyribose sugar, but since I was talking about DNA. So these blue sugars are, in fact, deoxyribose rather than ribose. Okay, right. So, uh, now, basically, you can attach carbonium ions onto these guanine organic bases, and it's because this nitrogen here which is known as the N7 nitrogen, so this is known as N7 nitrogen, it basically has a lone pair of electrons on it, okay? So here is a lone pair of electrons, and this lone pair of electrons is a center of negative charge, basically. So what can happen is the positive charge of the carbonium ion, this positive charge on this carbon atom here, can come and bind with this center of negative charge over here. And what will happen, basically, is that this carbon will nick one of the electrons off of that nitrogen, basically. So one of these electrons will be nicked by the carbon, and then the carbon does something very sneaky. It basically nicks an electron off the nitrogen, so it then gets a neutral charge, and the nitrogen gets a positive charge. So the nitrogen's now got a positive charge, and then it comes along and sneakily says, okay, let's share, uh, and persuades the nitrogen to then share its second electron with the carbon, and the carbon will, will share the electron that it's stolen off the nitrogen with the nitrogen. So it's really quite double-crossing. It nicks this electron off the nitrogen and then comes back and convinces the nitrogen to um, form a covalent bond where it will share its one remaining electron with that carbon. So you actually get a single bond between this nitrogen and that carbon. But that's why the positive charge is being transferred onto the nitrogen. So this is how you alkylate DNA. This is what's meant by DNA alkylation. So this is why uh, the nitrosoureas are called alkylating agents because you have now added this little hydrocarbon or alkyl group onto the DNA. So you have alkylated the DNA. Now, it doesn't stop there. It gets even better because what can happen is this chloride, this chlorine atom on the, um, on the alkyl group that you've added onto this guanine organic base, this can fall off, basically. And if we look at this bond between the carbon and the chlorine, there's uh, one electron provided by the chlorine atom and one electron provided by the carbon atom. And what can happen is when this bond cleaves, the chlorine will take both electrons. It will become a chloride anion over here, but that will leave this carbon with a positive charge. So basically, you're going to produce another carbonium ion, and what can happen is that can bind onto another guanine. So what you can end up getting is, if I get another piece of paper to show you this, is you can end up getting a guanine organic base here, which I'll just denote as a G, linked by this, these, this two carbon uh, hydrocarbon strands like so, so these two carbons like so, to another guanine, okay? Now, this means that you can link two organic bases. So, what you can form, basically, is inter- and intra-strand crosslinks. So, let me explain what inter-strand and intra-strand crosslinks mean. So, inter-strand crosslinks. Again, I think they should probably be maybe a, uh, with a dash like that in between. Okay, so let me explain what an interstrand crosslink is. So if we have the two anti-parallel strands of DNA which are complementary here, then an interstrand crosslink would be a covalent bond, 
of our covalent structure linking the two uh, strands of DNA. So this, if if you if the if one of these guanines was on one strand and the other was on the other, that would be an interstrand crosslink. In addition, you also will form intra-strand crosslinks. Okay, and intra-strand crosslinks are when the uh, two guanines that it links are on the same strand. So if these two guanines were on the same strand, then that would be an intra-strand crosslink. Now, what is the effect of forming these inter-strand and intra-strand crosslinks going to be? Well, basically, think about what happens when uh, we perform transcription, or even better, DNA replication. So we'll start with transcription. In order for transcription to occur, what has to happen? Firstly, the RNA polymerase enzyme has to come to the DNA. It has to open the DNA up, so it has to break apart the hydrogen bonds between the uh, complementary organic bases. And it then has to work its way along the uh, coding strand and, uh, and uh, synthesize a complementary strand of mRNA to that. Okay. Now, if you have interstrand crosslinks, it's not even going to be able to pull the two strands apart. Never mind actually synthesize complementary mRNA. Okay. If you've got intra-strand crosslinks, is it going to be able to synthesize uh, a complementary strand of mRNA? Absolutely not. So both of these um, forms of crosslinking are going to lead to transcription going down. In addition, what about DNA replication? Well, when DNA replication occurs, the DNA polymerase enzyme has to um, open the DNA strands up, so break the hydrogen bonds between the two complementary strands, and it then has to work its way along both strands and synthesize complementary strands to them. Okay, if you've got interstrand crosslinks again, then you're not going to be able to break open the DNA, and you're not going to be able to uh, move the two strands apart. So you're not going to be able to open them up. If you've got intrastrand crosslinks, then you're not going to be able to synthesize complementary uh, new DNA strands. So also DNA replication is going to stop. So if you throw these drugs onto cells, it's going to stop transcription and stop DNA replication because you're going to get these intrastrand crosslinks and interstrand crosslinks. So, why is this particularly bad for cancer cells? Well, basically, cancer cells are continually dividing. That's one of the major hallmarks of cancer, that they are over-dividing, and that's why you form tumours. Okay, so in order for a cell to divide in two, then what needs to happen is you need to copy the genome, i.e. all the DNA, so that uh, each of the daughter cells has a copy of the genome. And you also need to copy the proteome, all the proteins in the cell, because um, if you're going to go from being one cell to two cells, you're going to need to double the amount of proteins you have. So in order to divide, you need DNA replication and you need the production of new proteins. If you've blocked DNA replication and you've blocked transcription, you're not going to be able to divide because you're not going to be able to copy the genome and you're not going to be able to make more proteins. So uh, division is going to stop. Now, basically, this loss of transcription or D and DNA replication is not too devastating for a cell that is not dividing very fast basically, uh, because if a cell is perfectly happy, basically, if you've got a normal cell that's perfectly happy, why does it need to copy its DNA? It doesn't. Why does it need protein? Uh, well, why does it need to produce more proteins? It doesn't need to produce that much protein unless it's actually dividing. So it's not too devastating for cells which aren't dividing very rapidly. But for rapidly dividing cells, this is going to stop them rapidly dividing. That's its basis as a use as anti-cancer chemotherapy. In addition, this is why it's going to cause side effects, uh, for instance, because there are cells in the body which are physiologically dividing rapidly, such as the cells that make your hair, 
And if you stop them dividing very rapidly, then you're going to stop them making your hair. And that gives rise to the, um, uh, the famous side effect of anti-cancer chemotherapy, which is losing your hair. Okay, there are other examples of physiological um, rapid cellular proliferation which will be affected by uh, taking anti-cancer chemotherapeutics. Okay, right, so that's how it's going to um, stop cell division. It's also going to lead to the activation of um, potentially pro-apoptotic mechanisms because if you do this modification to the DNA, that basically can be recognized by the, the machinery that recognizes damage to the DNA. So it's not going to like these chemical modifications that you've made to the DNA whatsoever. So there are proteins, basically, which recognize DNA damage. And they will be activated by these inter- and intrastrand crosslinks. Now, to give two examples of these proteins, you have ATN and ATR. So these are two separate proteins which perform the same function. So ATM has the rather fantastic name ataxia telangiectasia, which is a quite rare disease, thankfully. Telangiectasia. Okay. And I think it's actually telang... No, that's it. Telangiectasia. And um, mutated. So that's the M. So ataxia telangiectasia uh, mutated is ATM, and ATR is ataxia telangiectasia. So it's got this same, uh, it's associated with the same uh, rare disease. Ataxia telangiectasia, and also, and RAD3, so this is the R, RAD3 related protein. Okay, so let me move this up. RAD3 related protein. Okay, so these two proteins will become activated when they uh, find DNA damage, and they are both kinase enzymes. So when they become activated, they will start adding phosphate groups onto other proteins. And what proteins are they going to phosphorylate? Well, they're going to phosphorylate two other proteins, known as CHK1 and also CHK2. Now, what do these stand for? Well, these stand for checkpoint kinase 1 and checkpoint kinase 2. So I'll just write checkpoint kinase 1. I don't think there's once. I don't think there's too much point in writing it twice. So checkpoint kinase 1 or checkpoint kinase 2. Now, checkpoint kinase 1 and 2, as their names suggest, is our kinase enzymes, basically. So, when they are phosphorylated by either ataxia telangiectasia mutated or ataxia telangiectasia and rad free related protein, then they are going to become active themselves and they are then going to phosphorylate P53. But we'll continue this discussion in the next video.